uh, it's an honor to talk to you. It's somebody I've gotten to study in graduate school and, and, and the like, and to bring you to our listeners and our coaches and our athletes and what you've done, it, it's a great honor. So thank you. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. So you, your expertise is memory, false memories, the stories we tell, eyewitness testimonies and things. Can you give just a synopsis of your body, tough question, your body of work, but just as what led you down this field and, and really scratch that itch that you had and, and why you went down that route? Well, first of all, the, the work that I've been doing all these decades is about memory, but it, it, it's really about memory distortion and false memories. It's about people who remember things that didn't happen or remember things um, differently from the way they actually did happen. Uh, and I've, um, over these many years, have been designing experiments to study this process by which we uh, pick up information from other sources and other places and other times, and it can contaminate or distort our memory. That's kind of what I, where I wanted to take this a little bit was the speculation. I, I find that in the world of coaching and sports performance, we all have these memories, right? We and and what I find when I work with clients is they'll go on this journey with me and they'll start describing 10, 15 years ago. And it's like the story that fish goes from here to to it was an eight pound bass and it was the greatest reel in I've ever had. Why do we do that? Why do we distort our memories for things about ourselves? And then why do we do that about things that we perceive in life to even things that we just see as passerby? Like what, what's behind that? There are lots of reasons why we remember things that are wrong. Um, sometimes we get suggestive information from other sources. Sometimes we get interrogated by people who have an agenda and ask us biased or leading questions. But um, your question also hints at the idea that with the example of the fish getting bigger, um, yes, we do have prestige enhancing memory distortions that happen in the minds of people um, that aren't, aren't, don't seem to be caused by external suggestion. So I don't know of any study that looked at fish and people's you know, estimates of the size of their fish. I think that would be a, a fun study to do actually. But there are studies showing that people remember that their grades were better than they really were. They remember they gave more to charity than they really did. They remember they voted in elections that they didn't vote in. Uh, they remembered that they behaved less selfishly uh, in a, a game that involved exchanges of money that, than they actually um, behaved. These are prestige enhancing memory distortions that maybe let us feel a little bit better about ourselves. Do you think that helps set us up for future things? Or do you think it's more about the past, rewriting the past to not feel down about ourselves? Well, both things could be involved. I mean, people have said that these, these memory distortions, these prestige enhancing memory distortions allow us to feel better about themselves, our, ourselves. Um, you know, so somebody tells you that, that you know, they, that they got an A in calculus in college when really they only got a B. I mean, the important thing to know is that that's a memory mistake that a lot of people make, and it doesn't mean they're deliberately lying to you. Maybe it's happening because they, it makes them feel better about themselves, but possibly, and here's where speculation comes in, it might, um, it might enable them at, at some point to, it might affect their future behavior. If, if they're feeling more confident or better about themselves, um, maybe it would affect what they do down, down the road. If we wanted to shape human behavior as a coach, as a leader, and you know, you look at sports and they'll, they, you know, coaches will bring players in and they'll show them videos and they'll show them past. And the natural thing is to show the, the areas where they need to correct, they need to fix, they, they, they highlight the negatives. Would you maybe advocate for almost having highlight reels instead? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know enough about that. Uh, I don't know enough about that. 
Um, well, let me tell you what I do know about and see if I can, we can together go in this direction. Perfect. This is fun for me. Thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, at some point after I'd done all of these, you know, hundreds and hundreds of experiments on memory distortion and planting false memories, um, I, I wanted with my collaborators to look at whether these false memories have repercussions for people. Can they affect people's subsequent thoughts, their intentions, or even their behavior? So let me tell you what we did. We, we planted a false memory that you got sick eating a particular food as a child. For some people, it might have been you got sick eating eggs, another you got sick eating pickles, another you, you got sick eating strawberry ice cream. And what we found is that people didn't want to eat those foods as much. Um, and when you put foods in front of people, they wouldn't eat as much of the food after they had developed this false memory. We also found you could do the opposite. You could plant a warm, fuzzy memory about a healthy food and people want to eat that food more. So we did this with asparagus, for example, and people were more interested in asparagus. So what this work shows is that these false memories do have repercussions. They can affect your subsequent thoughts, your intentions, or even your actual behavior. So now, um, you know, you want to extend that into the world of, of sports. Um, I don't know. You help me think about what, what, uh, how, how that might happen. And then I'm going to say we need to do the study to verify that this is more than just uh, you know, a speculation. You're making the goose, the the skin on the back of my neck move back up to get back into research. Um, oh, makes me nervous. Um, <laughs> but, but it makes me think about like teachers or coaches or managers who plant like persuasive comments to build maybe self-belief or self-efficacy, right? And the way that we're over time. I, I saw a brilliant keynote by a Navy SEAL commander and he was using the statement of why we put the motivational signs up over all the training sites is that we wanted people to see them so much that they start to internalize them, even if they're on the wall. And I guess that to me is like planting almost like false memories, right? It's like you're, you're implanting, you've beat this, you've done this so many times. And maybe that's where coaches, it's not that they need to be positive polys all the time, but maybe implanting what you're going to coach later, maybe like making sure that you're imparting that because just to your point, you created a false memory with a food that they didn't eat and they had a physiological reaction to not wanting to eat it. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I, but in this conversation, you're sort of raising, um, raising an interesting question about whether these discussions with the person you want to, to, to affect uh, the person whose behavior you want to affect, should it focus on what they did right? Should it even, or, sh or should it focus on what they did wrong? Yeah. And if it focuses on what they did right, should it do it accurately? Or should it do it in a way that instills some hope, confidence, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, you're brain the researcher. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, that's what's so cool to me. I, I, it's one of the things that when I first read some of your early research, and we were in the social psychology class at LSU, and you know, reading false memories, and this was after the Oklahoma City. This was during the trial or after the trial, and. And I know that put you on the line, right? That that probably wasn't the uh, a position to be in. Like, of give our listeners a little bit because I, I remember this part handed. You were you were a you were an expert witness for the Oklahoma City bombing, correct? The trial. Well, I, I was. I consulted on that case with the defense and had yeah. a number of meetings with the defense and actually went and met Timothy McVeigh during that consultation. But I didn't actually testify in the trial. Okay, but you provided to the consultation team. You were on the consultation. Yes. Team. Can you give? Because 
were you the source of the study where, because I remember a class that we were in in undergrad where somebody walks in, they leave, and then 30 minutes later, they ask you what they dropped off and, you know, that kind of effect. Is that right? Like, well, the people have been doing that kind of demonstration, you know, in classroom. So cool, it's so cool. You know, for probably for 100 years now. And we've done we've done that demonstration. I mean, in, in some of my large uh, uh, undergraduate classes, uh, we've had people, you know, come in and grab someone's um, purse or backpack and rush out of the room. And then we try to have people identify who the perpetrator was just to show how difficult it is to and how many different versions you can get. But th but that's a that's a kind of a classroom demonstration that can demonstrate things to students in the class that that we that we've been studying in more in a more controlled laboratory way. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you when you look at memory? I mean, when you look at the experiences that you've worked on over the years and everything has anything shocked you about what you've uncovered or learned well and i guess now it now it's not so shocking but some of the things that people think they remember are 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 pretty extraordinary um and it it it's pretty extraordinary to me that you could remember that you were forced by your parents to be part of a satanic rituals and kill animals and breed babies and kill those babies. But that was happening in yeah. a number of cases. It's, a, it's kind of extraordinary that otherwise intelligent, healthy, functioning people can believe and remember that they were abducted by aliens and taken up in spaceships and sexually experimented upon and then returned to their beds on Earth. How, do, how does that happen? It's still pretty fascinating to me that these kinds of ideas and, and what feels like actual recollection can be instilled in people when it didn't happen. Yeah. You... And it doesn't matter how much evidence you give on the opposite. It just continues to reinforce their belief, doesn't it? With many people, that's true. Um, of course, sometimes people, uh, well, we've got hundreds of examples of retractors who were, who were led often through suggestive psychotherapy to believe that their family members brutalized them for years. And then ultimately they, started to realize these memories weren't real. How does that happen? Yeah. As a memory scientist, that's pretty interesting too. How does somebody develop these memories, accuse other people, act on the memories, and then start to realize the memories are real? Um, you know, often one of the things that happened in those cases is the, the health insurance ran out. So they yes. no longer were continuing to see the problematic therapist that was helping shape and reinforcing these. Did we, besides the financial return, did we ever really understand why the therapist went down that route? I mean, were they as subject to the suggestion as anybody else? I, I well, I've been a little kinder to the therapist than some other uh, skeptics have been uh, in, in suggesting that they, they, you know, they just sort of had one and only one idea about what was wrong with their patient when they saw a certain set of symptoms and they advanced that theory and pursued that theory and eventually got their patients to buy into that theory. It's a amazing evidence of groupthink a little bit, I guess, of, of buying in. That's why it brings me back to like teams, right? You know, it's like I, I'm so fascinated by leaders and coaches and leadership organizations and and how you get people to follow and that's why what got me to like wanting to reach out to you was from memory of not false memories but more highlighting the positives to create uh, the the dialogue or the story of success like we watch a video of a company thing and they put up this beautiful picture of how great the company is and people rah rah it's almost like you're crafting the story and ignoring the negatives. 
Well, uh, probably what's going on in some of these situations, they just repeat it over and over and things start to get to sound more and more familiar. And then you can get draw people into it more and more deeply. Yeah. What do you, I want to shift here a little bit to leadership here. How many graduate students have come through your ranks under your leadership? Well, that's kind of a tough question to answer. I mean, because they're the graduate students that where I've been the chair of their PhD committee and they are, you know, many of them now teaching at other universities or working in corporations. Uh, some recent graduates, uh, you know, went to work for Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. working on things like, you know, fake news. Um, but then there's all the other graduate students that, Either I've been a member of their uh, dissertation committee or they've taken my my graduate courses. So, so I'm not qu quite sure what, you know, which number to give you. But um, no, I after, but I mean, your, your impact in the field is massive. Does that ever humble you? I mean, does that <laughs> does that inspire? I mean, you're very humble. But I mean, what I mean by that is you've made a hell of an impact on this field, not just on your research, not just on your testimony, not just on your leadership, but also on your mentorship and your guidance. I mean, you don't, you don't have the career or the CV that you have without it. I'm not trying to make you like, I'm, I'm not trying to um, kill you with platitudes and gratitudes, but it's true. Okay. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, I do feel pretty happy about the fact that, you know, I, I love this life because you can be a scientist and make discoveries and then also I get to work on very pretty interesting court cases and apply these discoveries uh, through expert testimony or at a trial. And and now um, I I see a, a lots of other people, um, some of whom have trained with me or some of whom have trained with people I trained who are out there doing similar things. And I think that the world is better off um, because of uh, people who are tr out there trying to get the world to appreciate this truth about memory yeah. and that we can't, we can't just, uh, you know, throw people into prison based on some, you know, somebody's, uh, you know, unscrutinized, re uncorroborated, re you know, recollection. Do you do a lot of work with like the Innocence Project and such? Over the years I have, yes. Yeah. Do you, do you see, I mean, I guess the question I would ask then is, because I want to come back to the fake news thing. Do you, how do you see the criminal justice reform needing to happen in this country? Because, you know, it's the same. The reason I bring that up is you look at like Title IX cases in athletic departments. There's a lot of concern of people, you know, reporting sexual abuse. And there's a lot of true cases. But what do you do about the cases that are fake or false? And the the judge and the jury that happens in the college and then the criminal justice system of of um, stigmatization as well as um, inappropriate representation and things like that how do you how do you marry how do you reconcile that in this world that we're in with all that we know I, well, I certainly know about a lot of those cases involving sports figures and um yeah. Uh, maybe we shouldn't get into some of the specific ones. Even yeah, some of the some of these cases where you think it's a done deal and and uh, you know the people got convicted and they're in prison and that's where they deserve to be. I believe that a number of those people are innocent. Do you? Oh yeah. And and even you know these Title IX cases that are are so common now it 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 is kind of interesting to me that it's it's always the uh, you know it two people could be very similar in age and similar in everything and go go out drinking together and get into some interaction and it's always the male that gets kicked out of school. Hmm. That's a that's probably a pretty controversial st statement, though, isn't it? I, I know where you're going with that, and I, I would actually agree with you. But that's a, that that opens up for a lot of scorn, doesn't it, and criticism? It it does, but there 
you know, of course there are real cases that need to be pursued, but um, somebody needs to, oh, somebody needs to worry about the falsely accused. Yeah. What was the movie that was done years ago with Michael Douglas and Demi Moore? Disclosure. Fatal Attraction. Fatal Attraction too. Another one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it happens. And uh, it, it's, it's, how do you, how do you prove an absence or a, a negative of didn't do it, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I had one case not long ago where uh, there were actually uh, witnesses to the interaction because the door was cracked open and roommates were peeking in during the interaction. And they told a very, very different story than the story that got told in the court records. So there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of difficult situations out there. Well, I know the the one of the highest profile ones was the Duke lacrosse case. Oh, now that was I consulted on that case too. I mean, Did you? but but there you had a situation where um, the accuser um, said it was a a Caucasian Duke lacrosse player, three of them, and she shown basically a, a a photo lineup with all the Caucasian. Duke lacrosse players and any three she picked were going to become the three defendants. And that's what happened. Is it, is it agendas or is it the need to serve the victim? I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm not sure about, you know, what was going on in that, in that particular case, but certainly what happens in some of these other cases where there's some kind of consensual interaction that goes on and then somebody's got some regrets. Hmm. Yeah. How would you, how would you, well, there's a question I had that came up today from a, uh, somebody in a, in an athletic department about educating student athletes, given the fact that it's a contentious and a potentially volatile and dangerous world, how would you, what would you recommend? I mean, to ask them to abstain and never put themselves in those situations is almost impossible. So how do you? I, know, do I don't you think that's that's not too realistic. Yeah, it's not at all. No, no, no. It's like yeah. don't say, just say no. It doesn't work. So what would and, you? And and even them? you know even this sort of requirement for an affirmative, uh, you know, yes is, you know, is is a kind of a pretty awkward situation for a lot of young people. Yeah. Very. Yeah. What, what would you recommend? I mean, how would you? If you were standing in front of an audience of student athletes, male and female, what would you tell them? I'm I mean, not I, sure. I, I'm, I'm a memory person, you know. I know not, you are, but but you're. <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah. fascinating to me, right? I, I, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm not yeah. But it's fascinating. Is there a um? Is there is there something that in the memory that we're understanding more and more from a, I guess, a biological standpoint or a neurobiological that we're going to be able to influence the memories in a different way coming down the road. Like whether it's, I mean, not true serum, that's not what I'm talking about, but patterns or, or study or something like that over the years. I mean, virtual reality, things like that. Uh, well, uh, one of the things I, you know, I used to, I, I have maintained that without independent corroboration, you know, you can't know whether you're dealing with a genuine memory or one that's a product of some other process, imagination, suggestion, bias. Um, so what it, what counts as independent corroboration? Well, sometimes there are photos or videos that can provide independent corroboration. Certainly that's why police officers now wear the body cams and now you can replay uh, from the body camera what actually transpired when some unfortunate event happens. But now we, we live in a world where doctored photographs and even deep fake videos are, are getting in the, in the hands and within the capability of all kinds of ordinary people. So we even have to be suspicious of photos and videos because you can now make a video and make it look like somebody is saying or, or, or doing just about anything you want them to say or do. Yeah, I guess that leads to the fake news thing, right? And particularly with this election cycle with 
the claims that are, have been made about fraud and, and videos that may have been, I saw a video that was circulated from another country that was claimed to have been in one of the contested districts and it runs on social media and all of a sudden it gets passed on like an urban myth. Um, why fake, I mean, I guess fake news is because we can just manufacture, it's almost like we're living in the Truman Show or Altered State or any of those environments where we're creating our own realities, right? Uh, well, I don't know about that, but we are in an infodemic. We are inundated with information. Some of it's true and some of it isn't. And all kinds of uh, you know smart people are trying to figure out what, what we can do about this. Um, and one thing I think we can do is stop and think before we share. <laughs> so I, you know, Facebook. That's a good point. That's a good yeah, point. Facebook has you know. I, recently, I went to share something that someone else had posted on Facebook, and up pops a message from Facebook saying, "Do you do you realize this article you're about to share is eight years old?" And I thought, oh my gosh, no, I had no idea. I don't want to share this eight-year-old article. So it, it got me to stop and think. And Facebook could do more of that. And we could do some of that ourselves. Like stop and think, is it really a good idea? Because it's not only a, a receiving the, the fake news, it's also being part of the problem of sharing it and spreading it. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I got sent a Twitter survey and I said the first thing you need to do is get rid of bots that create fake profiles because people perceive them as real and you, they're really AI or they're somebody's got an agenda and I guess it's the same way with um, you know Facebook is is I guess credibility rankings of sources or journalists uh, I use the word journalist because there's journalists and then there's people who share propaganda you know on both sides across this world and I guess maybe a credibility ranking would be helpful to maybe help that. You know, it's like this is an author who's been deemed whatever for so long, or this is somebody who's very high and been fact checked. I guess that would help. But those don't seem to get shared, do they? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. And, and who's going to do the ratings? You know, yeah. who, who are we going to trust to do the ratings? That's exactly right. That, exactly that, right. that needs to be figured out, too. Uh, I'm a, I'm one more question. And I'm gonna let you have your day and 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 go. But this is fascinating to me. And it stimulated a lot of questions, and I hope our listeners um, feel the same way. When when you look, when we have conflicting information to our memory that pops in our head, what's the best way for us to resolve it? Because it creates that cognitive dissonance. It creates that discomfort. How do we? How should we resolve it? One of the things I do, I mean, one of the things that all this work has taught me is that um, to be a little more tolerant of the mistakes that um, my friends, family members, or even I myself might make, I, I don't instantly jump to the conclusion that somebody is deliberately lying, yet I entertain the possibility that they truly might believe in, in what they're saying. Mm. and. Uh, you know, it's a it's a kinder way to feel about people. I mean, it, uh, to to not to think that people are big fat liars, but they may just have a have a false memory. Uh, and uh, that I guess that would be a bit of advice I would give to people. And maybe you know, maybe you don't need to change the person. You don't have to fight every battle. So if you have a if you have a disagreement with somebody about some detail. Maybe let it go. Yeah, and we don't need to have a, an argument about it, do we? Right, right. Not that important. What about with falling for, or maybe with people we agree with too quickly? Is there anything there? Like, you know, kind of falling into camps, you know? Um, we are in camps. Yeah. We're, we're, in camps and we all have confirmation biases we are more readily accept the you know ideas and factoids that fit with our pre-existing biases we're ready to uh, accept false information about an enemy um and we just need to be aware of these of these biases and then you know maybe strategize about how to how to fix the situation or maybe that much. 
these cognitive biases, there has to be an evolutionary reason as to why we have them. It's got to be, right? Maybe different reasons for different ones. Yeah. But, you know, I think having a malleable memory um, certainly means that when spontaneous errors creep in, you can update with true information. That would be useful. That would be good. That would be good. Yeah. Dr. Loftus, thank you so much for your time. This was fascinating. And, and I appreciate sure. it. Sure. Well, great chatting with you and best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. You stimulated some questions and, and uh, I hope it stimulates some questions in all of our coaches and our athletes that are out there.